Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Keith Dunn. I'm the provost and dean of the College of Millsaps, and it's my pleasure and privilege here to welcome you to a very special presentation that's part of our Friday Forum series. Uh, before we get started, I want to tell you that next week's forum will be the last of our spring series. It's sponsored by the Winter Speaker Series and will feature U.S. Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana and will be held in the recital hall right down the hall off the second floor lobby. So we invite you to come back at the same time, close to the same place, uh, next, next Friday. Well, it's really my pleasure today to welcome you to the 10th Annual Rabbi Perry Nussbaum Lecture. I continue to believe that the Nussbaum Awards and Lecture Series are among the best and most important things that we do at Millsaps. The Nussbaum Awards provide us with an opportunity to celebrate and reflect on real heroes on our road towards civil justice. They serve to remind us of the progress we've made and the obstacles we've faced. More importantly for me, though, the Nussbaum Awards force me each spring to come to grips with the fact that many of the impediments to civil justice and fairness that our esteemed awardees have courageously faced are still with us as a society. To put it frankly, these events help me to keep in the forefront of all that I do that there is work yet to be done, and it's my responsibility and privilege to be involved in that work. The Rabbi Perry Nussbaum and lecture series, Award and Lecture Series was established by Dr. John Bauer with an endowment he generously gave to the college in 2009. In this way, Dr. Bauer established a permanent means by which we publicly recognize and honor the courageous sacrifice and contributions made by his dear friend in the fight for civil rights and social justice. Later, I encourage you to look at the back of your program where you'll see a, a better description of, of Rabbi Nussbaum's work. I encourage you to read it, and particularly if you are not familiar with his story. The inaugural lecture was held in 2010. Dr. Bauer is not with us today. He was with us last night at the awards ceremony, but I do want to take a moment to thank him on behalf of Millsaps College and the community for sponsoring an event such as, inspira uh, as inspirational as the Rabbi Nussbaum's uh, award and lecture series. And I want to personally thank him for allowing Millsaps to be the partner and host uh, for this great event. Last night at the awards dinner, we honored Lucy J. Allen, director of, museum, of the museum's division at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History as the 2018 Nussbaum Civil Justice Award recipient. You will hear from Lucy and colleagues from the two museums in just a few moments. I do want to say that I'm particularly excited about today's program and the topic of truth-telling journeys. Last summer, Millsaps was selected by the American Association of Colleges and Universities to be one of 10 campus centers around the country to implement a program funded by the Kellogg Foundation and Newman's Own. The Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Center is working at Millsaps to engage community members in truth-telling narratives around race, dialogue that promotes racial healing, and work that transforms communities. We are fortunate to have two extraordinary museums in our community to support this work. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Stephen Rolfe, Associate <coughs> Professor of History at Millsaps and the Academic direct Director of the Shepherd Higher Education Consortium on Poverty. Dr. Rolfe will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. Stephen.
working her way in memoir form through the idea of Southern tradition, white identity, and the expressions that white identity in the form of white supremacy have had, unfortunately, in a lot of negative ways on this landscape. And I, as she was telling the, um, weaving the story, one of the examples she used was a trick that her, one of her baby nurses used to use with toddlers and young children to keep them out from underfoot. The baby nurse would put molasses on the children's hands and then throw feathers at them to keep them occupied. Because if you try to take a feather off, it's just going to stick to the other hand and it could keep them occupied for hours. <laughs> it's a good trick. Um, we might use it with, with uh, children of all ages. Um, but she used that story as a way to exemplify the way in which the facts of Southern history and the myths of Southern history are often so inextricably intertwined with each other that it's difficult to figure out what's real and what has been passed down to us from future generations. And that entire book, Killers of the Dream, is really dedicated to ch challenging, especially white Southerners, with confronting their history, as painful as that may be, and making the concessions and, um, and coming to terms with some of, the, some of the approaches that they need to take in order to move forward. So as I make this introduction, uh, introduction to Lucy Allen, my, my colleague at Mississippi Department of Archives and History, I think of her as really critical to the molasses and feather question. Um, I think there are a few of us who know as how tricky this process can actually be than Lucy. Lucy began her career with Mississippi Department of Archives and History in the Old Capitol Museum as assistant curator. This is one of my earliest exposures to history as a child. From there, she moved into the director of education position before she returned to the Old Capitol Museum, while simultaneously being appointed the director of the museum division. Shortly after that, she began to oversee as project director um, the two Mississippi Museum project, which many of us have joyfully watched unfold over the years. Um, as project director, she worked over the course of several years overseeing the construction and design for over 200,000 square feet of space. And it's that work on the museum and in a rich and rewarding career that we want to honor today here at Millsaps with the Nussbaum Award. Over the course of its development, Lucy organized and led community conversations with citizens across the state in order to elicit the most accurate and inclusive depictions of Mississippi history as we could expect. This is a challenging process. Her leadership and the tireless work of countless staff members, historians, and community members has elicited a stunning portrait of the state's history through the Museum of Mississippi History and a focus block for its challenges in the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum which also has the distinction of being the first state-funded civil rights museum in the country. After nearly 40 years of public service, Lucy was very recently awarded the Dunbar Rowland Award from the Mississippi Historical Society in recognition of outstanding lifelong contributions to the preservation, study, and interpretation of Mississippi history. Congratulations, Lucy. talking about her years-long journey from the earliest visions of these museums to the daily operations that, that we're now experiencing today, the challenges that she faced, and also offering some reflections on her personal experience with this as she interacted with Mississippians from across the state and their personal histories and memories in this place. And her work, I think, really exemplifies what we should all be doing which is seeking the most comprehensive version of our truths as members and citizens of the state. I'm also pleased to welcome two other colleagues today, the uh, directors of the two museums, Pamela Jr. and Rachel Myers. Will you please stand? Just wave to the camera. Oh, hey. <laughs> Pamela and Rachel will 
will join Lucy in a panel discussion after Lucy's presentation to talk about some of their experiences in overseeing this vision and um, managing it on a daily basis. Pam Jr. is formerly the manager of the Smith Robertson Museum and Cultural Center. She currently serves as the director of the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. She has more than 17 years of experience as a museum professional. Under her leadership, the Smith Robertson Museum was named 50 states 50 on the 50 states 50 spots list by CNN in 2014. Pam is a native to Jackson, a graduate of Winfield High School and Jackson State University. Rachel Myers is director of the Museum of Mississippi History. She previously served as the Museum and Special Projects Coordinator at the Institute of Southern Jewish Life here in Jackson. She is not native to Mississippi, but she is choosing to be here now, which we're so happy about. She's a native of Connecticut, a graduate of Brandeis, and got her MA in Museum Studies from John, Johns Hopkins University. She lives um, near here in Fondren with her husband and young son. And her message to you today is she looks forward to seeing you at the Museum of Mississippi <laughs> History soon. Welcome. storyline. 
However, the storyline was the Eurocentric white male story. A little dab of Native American, a little dab of African American, and a little dab of women's history thrown in. Patty Black was the leader that saw in the 90s, in the 80s and the 90s, that we need to redo that old 1961 museum as well. She was one of the ones that talked about adding to the history. And the first one she was going to tackle, nine years after pretty much the end of the Civil Rights Movement, very, very shortly thereafter, in 1984, we opened up the first permanent civil rights museum in the country, I mean, exhibit in the country. It was one of those exhibits in 1984, and it received national attention. Then later on in the 90s, as we were doing the colonial period, we thought about the stories we were going to tell and the people who would represent those stories, and we came up with an idea of forming a community advisory committee. We wanted to hear from the very voices about their very own stories of their ancestors. So we included Native American, Spanish, French, English descendants, and African Americans to help us tell that story. And a few years later, when we were planning for the State History Museum, we expanded that community advisory committee to more than 20 different cultural, ethnic, and religious groups, about 50 people on that. They still are working with us today. We plan on them working with us in perpetuity. We went to the Muslim community, the Institute for Southern Jewish Life, the Chinese, Italian, and Native American leadership. We didn't choose the membership. The community chose who they wanted to be their members. And they met with us, they helped us provide artifacts, they told stories that we had not, not heard before, and they felt ownership of working with this. Working with the community, engaging the community during the planning and construction process, we went to many, many community meetings across the state. We went to Oklahoma as we were developing the History Museum where the civil rights story originally would be told. In 2011, when we received the funding in the funding bill, a Mississippi Civil Rights Museum Advisory Commission was formed. And then in 2012, we decided to concentrate on those communities that uh, were active in the civil rights movement across the state. We also held stakeholders meetings about the architectural design of the Civil Rights Museum. We got a lot of feedback on that. We also participated in local civil rights conferences and celebrations around the state so that we could hear firsthand all the stories that we were gathering. There were some challenges with community meetings. Well, first of all, many people mistrusted the state. They certainly trusted some of the state leaders, and they had a public or negative perception of state agencies from the past, like the Sovereign Commission, and quite frankly, maybe the Department of Archives and History as well, because we had omitted history, and we had diluted stories about some very diverse and complex history when we were depicting our history. We also wanted to learn from others, so we traveled to state history museums that were new in Kentucky, Tennessee, and Alabama. We also went to Memphis, <coughs> Birmingham, and Selma, and Whitehall, and Montgomery, Alabama. And we brought in consultants from North Carolina for civil rights museums to help us. When we were trying to get it right and be truthful, here's what we heard. Tell the truth, no matter how brutal, do not whitewash it. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't leave out the ugly parts. Don't pull any punches. We heard the voices and stories, but we listened to them. We recorded the meetings. We recorded individual stories, and then we followed up after that. We're, in fact, still collecting stories and artifacts, something that will, will continue. We also wanted to be truthful and talk about the national story and the Mississippi story because they go together. You cannot tell one without the other. We also expanded our core scholars to include specialists, the veterans, the Native Americans, the immigrants. We had gaps in our collection, so we sought to try to fill those gaps, the very gaps that I've talked about, a lot of African American 
time period, women's history, and, and a lot of those ordinary average people that made a difference. We wanted to get those things because artifacts are the thing that make a story come alive. We changed the, we designed the exhibit spaces to accommodate the community in, input. One of the things that they asked us to do is look back and look forward. So we wanted to talk about the um, African American story and what had happened prior to the Civil Rights Movement and then to also talk, take it up to modern day. The heart of the museum is this little light of mine and the blades inside the sculpture, they reach back and they talk about the early days in the 16 and 17 and 1800s, and then the blades reach forward into Gallery 8 as well to connect with modern day voices. We heard de depict the fear, the pain, the violence, the humiliation, the danger, the anger. We did. But we have a warning at the beginning. We say, and it reads, note to visitors to present a true and accurate story. The stories told here include acts of violence, oppression, and injustice. Quotations and documents are presented in their original context, and some include offensive images and language. Warning signs indicate graphic content. We also created an exhibit technique called flashpoints and super flashpoints, which you'll see a, a little bit of in just a moment. They were a way of us showing that violence from the gunshots, the explosions, the destruction, and other violent acts. We didn't shy away from, the community didn't want us to, we did not shy away from the story they mentioned. It is one of the integral parts of that story, and we, we talk about lynching from 1882 all the way through 1970. We talk about the KKK, Jim Crow, and we use a lot of stereotypical things so that people can understand the setting and the time periods from which um, represent the past. We also, in both museums, want to include the community story. They ask us to do that. It doesn't matter how big a museum is, it cannot possibly tell every single thing. And so we decided we, weren't, we, we couldn't, nor should we try. Why not send people to the communities where the history actually happened? So we have something called Explore Mississippi Panels in both museums. They take people to historic sites and other museums throughout the state. We heard, showed that there were those who took a stand but at a cost. And there were those, many people that took a stand at, at a cost. One of the exhibit techniques is called points of light. We have Florence Mars, Vito Welty, Robert Clark, Ed King, and dozens and dozens and dozens more. And about a dozen more we're working on now, right Pam? And of course, Rabbi Perry Newsbaum is one of our points of light. We heard that you need to honor them. This museum needs to honor and memorialize the veterans. And so really, gall uh, Gallery 3, which is the heart of the museum, we feel is the true place where people will be able to reflect and honor. It's a place where you have to go in and out of through every gallery journey. So therefore, you have a place to reflect, to rest, to um, look at those, some, some we have lost, others are still with us today doing work. And also, you can be uplifted by the music that the sculpture plays, because music was, of course, an integral part of the movement. And then we heard, we need to talk about what's going on today. So we have that gallery, where do we go from here? inspire people rather than have them leave down and depressed. After we had developed the storyline, it seemed a little down and depressing, and so <laughs> as we were sharing it with the community. And so we, we feel that throughout we have very uplifting stories, but we also have an exit experience at both museums. The exit experience in the Museum of Mississippi History is called Discover Your Mississippi, and we have quotes from people like Welty, Robert Walker, Alexander, Walter Anderson, and many, many more. 
I'd like to read two of my favorite quotes at the end. Like all immigrants, we hope that diversity will lead not to dissonance, but to greater harmony. See this Ren Watson. And then Claire Collins Harvey says, using this power within us, we can help to make life what it should be for any people, at any time, and in any place. And in the Civil Rights Museum, our exit experience, we have quotes on the wall that are attached to mirrors that we hope that people will literally look at themselves and think about what they would want their individual light to shine for. And the final quote is my favorite quote, and uh, I give that credit to Pam for choosing this one as the final one. If you want to be proud of yourself, you have got to do things you can be proud of. O.C.O. and Cardi. Now I'd like to show you, give you a quick walkthrough of the museum.
ask you to leave your own reflections. Not only do you, would, can you take a picture and leave your reflection of maybe a memory you have of growing up in Mississippi or maybe an artifact that you may have connected with, Rachel, I said, sorry, I said we. Rachel will put your reflections back in the exhibit in the museums because we have reflections monitors in all of the galleries downstairs. On the civil rights, we all have a national timeline in all of our galleries. Just some images of showing this a flashpoint, as I mentioned, and then a super flashpoint that happens to be Rabbi and Mrs. Nussbaum in the center image there after their home was bombed. Examples of points of light and other types of, of threads and stories that we tell throughout. This is the first gallery to get a glimpse of this little light of mine. Let me show you. In April 1964, more than 70 crosses burned in Mississippi. The White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan were determined to disrupt Freedom Summer. They wanted to scare off the young Northern volunteers who would soon be flooding the state. They chose Michael Schwerner as a target. Voices and answers to 
today's questions about where do we go from here. And that's the actual image. Front <coughs> and dark pink.
We literally had people that said, I'll never set foot in the museum. And I can say that two people that told me that, one comes to all the programs, <laughs> and the other one is now a donor and has given us artifacts. So we, we, we have come a long way with, with those two individuals, and I think each individual is a very important way to start. Uh, as, as we were traveling around, one of the things, the first things we did was talk to the Black Caucus, and um, I remember just as well as if it were yesterday, and I know, Katie, you were in there, Robert was too. Representative O'Miria Scott was the chair of the Black Caucus, and as we were talking with them about what they wanted to see in the museum, she said, I have a question to ask you. How are you going to show all of the pain without us feeling like we have a chip on our shoulders? And the first thing that came to my mind was all of the people that I'd heard in the past saying, you know, get over it. Move on and just get over it. And right then and there, I said, gosh, we've got to do it right. And, we, and we've got to do it right because I, it was painful for her to even ask that question. I saw the pain in her eyes. Then shortly thereafter, we traveled to Montgomery, and uh, Trey, and, uh, Trey, Trey was my driver that day, I remember that. And we went inside of the Martin Luther King Dexter Street Par Parsonage. And Shirley, uh, uh, Shirley Cherry was her name. She was a former teacher and she was director. She made that house come alive. It was as if we were in the house and Martin Luther King and his children and his wife were there too. And when we went into the kitchen, and I brought my Kleenex, because I may cry when I tell this, but when she started saying the prayer that he said at his kitchen table while we're standing there, and the kitchen is very small, saying, God, I, I, you need to give me strength to go on because they're gonna murder my, my children and my wife. I lost it. It was as if he were a part of me, or was my father saying that. That was a change. And then who could not be changed by Merle Evers? She, the first time I really got a chance to talk with her was in 2003. And um, then right after we opened up and we had a luncheon, she said, Lucy, these museums are healing me. And I think that's a wonderful thing, and that, that, that helps. So I um, reflect on all of the people that I've worked with and the people that I've met, like the Damer family, and going and sitting in their living rooms. I, I can't imagine ever meeting a more kind or loving or forgiving family than the Damers. So I think about every day what type of subconscious stereotypical thoughts I may have and how they might show up in my actions. So I do think about that because it's hard to be put in the place of others that you have not. And then there's somebody sitting over here to my left named Pamela Jr. And she just really got me when she told the story when she was a kindergartner and first grader and second grader and third grader and having to hide in places on the way to school and run as fast as she could because she was threatened and yelled at and even beaten. And I think, that didn't happen to me when I was growing up. That was not something I even had to think about. So instead of enjoying her elementary school, in the morning and the afternoon, she worried about how she was going to get to school or get back home again. And that helped transform me. Thank you. Rachel, if you'll take the mic. Rachel is a director of the Museum of Mississippi History, as you'll remember. And Rachel, we I'm sure you get this question quite a bit, but the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum has gotten a lot of attention in November and December as, as you all were preparing for the opening of those museums. Could you tell us a little bit about what you see as the distinct differences between the two spaces, the similarities, maybe some of the surprises that people find in the Mississippi side? Of course, funny you should ask them. <laughs> no, first I want to say that I'm humbled by this immensely. Um, you know, being able to stand with someone like Lucy and Pam and just talking about these museums, 
Uh, I take it with me every day. But we want to defy expectations at the Museum of Mississippi History. Uh, and as you said, people are coming in with certain expectations. They expect this to be the celebratory museum of, of Mississippi and the stories. And um, as Lucy mentioned, kind of this Eurocentric, you know, old guard. Uh, and we defy those in the museum. Uh, the theme, as Lucy was mentioning, is what Mississippi many stories. And that comes from the years of work that you spent building these relationships and talking to the people and ensuring that their voices and their artifacts and their stories um, are all featured there. Uh, so I think that people who haven't heard Lucy's talk won't know that until they come in uh, and they start to read the lines between the lines. There's one in particular I'd like to share, and I'm bringing it up because I think it defines the, the work, essentially. Uh, that, you know, by only sharing the, these kind of old guard stories, it's old fashioned. It's, it's not a 2018 interpretation of, of Mississippi history. Uh, and by diversifying it, it gives us power. In each of the galleries, you really find out who was living there and who had power and who had privilege and who did not. And you walk into the territorial period, you imagine these white settlers, but you also imagine the native peoples that were being forced and ceded their land. You're imagining enslaved people being brought into the, to the uh, state in mass. And each label, you're realizing what that experience must be like. But we're also providing three-dimensional views of these people. There's one in particular. I, I've only been with the department a year. <laughs> Lucy's has been many years. I don't know if you give that away. Uh, and so it's my early days, and then I'll admit I'm not the historian, and so I sat at my desk and I'm reading through all the labels that the team had so artfully and very carefully put together. Uh, and I stopped at one. I'm talking about Carrie Bell Kearney. Anyone familiar with this woman in Mississippi history? No. No participation from the audience, no. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not, Rachel, stop it. No. Uh, yes, and uh, she is this woman. She was a, a Mississippi elite, and we have her portrait, and we have her family's uh, chocolate cups, and she grew up in a, in a plantation. And, and this is the label, and we would assume that she was Mrs. Carrie Bell Kearney. She was born on her family's Flora Plantation in 1863. Start to imagine what, what that must be like. She went on to become a suffragette, a prohibition advocate, and the first woman elected to the Mississippi State Senate. And so you imagine, oh, I'm this 13-year-old girl, I'm reading this, and I'm feeling empowered, and look at us, like, you know, women, fight the man. Uh, not that, but something. <laughs> but it doesn't stop there, the label. It continues. She was also a white supremacist who believed that giving women the vote would be about, and then in quotations, Immediate and durable white supremacy honestly attained. I dropped the piece of paper on there and I just looked at it. I was like, I'm in the right place. We're telling the right story. That she ran on this platform because she knew that's how she could win. And she knew that she could outnumber the black male vote. And in 2018, now I get to stand there and we're talking about intersectionality in the Museum of Mississippi History. We're talking about what it means to be a trailblazer on one front and to succeed, uh, but what it looks like to be on the back of someone else's sacrifice. It's a really small label. It's a really small photo. I think as I don't point it out, most people, by the time you get to 1923, you're kind of tired in the museum and you'll probably walk right by it. Uh, but uh, my challenge for everyone that goes in there is to say that narrative, those stories are all throughout all of these galleries within every single object and artifact. But there's more to her, of course. You know, I'm not going to be the one to say, you know, it, she's not next to a variety of other really fantastic, passionate women and men and immigrants and, and you know, men and enslaved people. Like, there are heroes here. But what's important for me and for people to know about the Museum of Mississippi History is that now we get to consider what it looks like for us. My challenge for everyone whenever I'm chatting about history museums is when you're walking through, where do you place yourself? What it will be like 100 years from now, 50 years from now, 10 years from now, when your photo is on the wall? What is your impact in the community? What is your bio going to say based off of the content of, of the time we're living in. In 2018, what are we going to say about you and what you were doing? I think that ties in directly to the Civil Rights Museum. 
I think if you're walking through the History Museum and you start to understand the context and the humanity of our, of our heroes and the, the struggle it must have been like to live in this state throughout time, we start to understand the humanity of ourselves. My own bias, my own privilege, what it looks like for me to walk through as a white woman in Mississippi today. Uh, and again, based on the sacrifices and struggles of, of others. So I think in comparison, yes, we're doing different stories, a different amount of history. Uh, but as Marley mentioned, and Lucy said she was inspired by Marley, uh, the museums have the same heart of us taking a deep look at ourselves and the impact that we have on our neighbors and our communities. I'll lift it, I'll leave it there. I'll let Pam go and then we'll, we'll keep chatting. I don't want to take up too much of the time. Thanks. Thank you. Pam, you're really on the ground and I know we talked quite a bit about your experiences with people coming into the Civil Rights Museum. Can you give us a little bit of insight about how people are processing the exhibits, the spaces, the images, and what your conversations have been like, maybe through a story that, that you can share with the rest of us? You know, the first thing that people are interested in is the message authentic. Is it truthful? Now, I've lost a lot of friends and colleagues, and that was very surprising to me, to know that working in a place that is authentic and truthful, that people would stop talking to me because I'm working in a state agency. I figured it out. Because there's no more, uh, as they would say, marching down the street, even though that's a part of who I am, because I'm a rebel. I work here because I'm a rebel. And I've learned from working in this museum that people that have never walked into something like this are now able to get it. They see the ills of Mississippi on the walls. First of all, they don't know how to process it. First of all, they don't understand that this really happened. I've seen men so angry that they cried out. I've seen women yelling and wailing. And I've had conversations with staff members to leave them alone. Don't bother them, don't ask them what they need because they're processing their own pain. This is an anger that is so deep and so dark and so in the bones from enslavement that if this is what it takes to bring this out, let it be, let it be. And then you get people who say, oh my God, this is the best thing that could ever happen. It's like sweet iced tea in Mississippi. It's like watching a monarch butterfly just flittering through the sky. It's like watching a bumblebee get honey. All of those things. And it has changed me. It has changed me. So if I know that it has changed me, it can't help but change people. Because we're telling the truth. It's time for this. You know, what I tell people is that when you go into gallery two, it's like this dark tunnel that you're walking through. You're able to get through it, but you see those 600 names of people who have been lynched. These are documented people, but then there are the people that are still in the river, that they'll never, their names will never be said again. And they're still crying out. This museum is so sacred. It's so spiritual. It's like getting a new religion when you walk in there. And then when you're able to walk out, when you get to where do we go from here? There's a lot to get there to get to Gallery 8. There's this place that you can say, what do I do? How do I work in Mississippi? What is my chore? What is my charge? Because you need something. You can't come out of there and not have something to do, not have work to do. Again, as Lucy said, that the old quote from Osceola McCarty, if you want to be proud of yourself, you have got to do things you can be proud of. 
if you can't walk out of that place having that charge to work, then you haven't gotten anything. But if you can reconcile with yourself by looking at yourself in the mirror, that's enough. That's enough for you to want to go out and work in your community. Because it's going to take us. As I tell people, Martin is gone, Malcolm is gone, Mega is gone. But you're still here. What will you do? Because those saviors are not going to swap down. They're not going to swoop down and say, here I am. We're here now. The Mississippi Civil Rights Museum is here now. It's on the walls. It's here now. What do you do with it? Thank you, all three of you, for such thoughtful responses. I, I know you're dying to ask questions, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here about your deal. It, uh, the museums are absolutely gorgeous, and it's, it brings us great pride that they're not part of our community. Um, Lucy, you mentioned that in your, your talk, the, the steps off the arduous steps of getting to this place. I'm curious if you could spend some time focusing on your vision for the future. How do you imagine these museums going forward and being living museums through special exhibits, through innovative programming, and other things like that? Well, I, I started out as a school teacher before I came to work at the museum. And I'm very proud to say, Pam, that I am in my 40th year there. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love every aspect of what I have done in the past, but education has always been my passion. I felt like the exhibits were, were education, and then when I became director of education. So what I see moving forward is that, um, and I, I've said this to Katie, that uh, we educate the nation and then be, go beyond that, <laughs> that we educate People. And education is more than just reading something and understanding it. It's your whole being when, you, when you're educated about how you think and how you act. So I guess if I had to sum it up in one word, it would be educate. I'll, I'll hop onto that just for a moment to say that it's, it's neat to see intergenerational groups now coming through and thinking specifically about children. Uh, there are families who are coming in and there's some older people who, who don't recognize the story we're telling. It doesn't mesh with the one that they've been told growing up or that's been passed down necessarily. So I enjoy the opportunity that now the younger generation is kind of recognizing its own narrative and, and getting inspired by it and then reaching back out to their family generations and, and confronting and embracing Mississippi history in, in a new way. Um, you know, I have a young son, I'm a young mom, um, and to imagine that my son is growing up in a city like Jackson that has these two museums, he'll always know Mississippi to be this way, I tend to be proud that Mississippi is, is talking about its history this way. You know, one thing that I do with children, especially the little babies that come in, because we're talking about the civil rights <laughs> movement, so you have to be really creative. We have kindergartens gardeners coming in. So what do I do? I get on the floor with them in Gallery 3 and teach them protest songs. And one of the, their favorites is this little light of mine. So I, I teach them the song and I know that it's going to come on. And then we all stand up and we start marching and singing because I want them to understand their light. Because I didn't understand what I was singing as a little girl when I was singing in, in the Baptist Training Union at 5.30 on a Sunday evening. This little light of mine with a candle in my hand. So now, teaching them this song, they get it. And it's just amazing to see those little babies singing songs like that. I want to elaborate on, on what you, you said, because I just simply just said educate. We really want everyone, teachers and students and adults alike, to literally think about uh, two museums and the department, the whole campus, as a place to, uh, a learning center. So not only will we do outreach and distance learning, but we want people to come there. We want um, graduate studies people to come and 
work with us and to, to learn. So we feel like we would be a place that maybe people across the nation would say, if you want to go somewhere and really learn about something in depth and spend some time with you need to, to embrace and come there. So we'd like to be known as the number one education center for sure for civil rights, but um, for um, Mississippi history and a lot of national history, which is what we're a part of. So we want to be the place that draws people and that we're kind of known for that. Other questions? Uh, so the question from Sam. Uh, I'm struck so much in visiting the museum what an oral experience is as well as a visual experience it is. It's, first of all, a very powerful visual light of mind song, but, but in other ways throughout the museum, uh, especially in one of the galleries where the voices are so oppressive and aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the visitors, it, it's an immersive experience for the visitor in, in many ways. So I'm wondering how that. Really, that Lucy should be answering that question, then I'll piggyback off of what she said. We were challenged with trying to get a visitor, and I'll say me, a white woman. How would I know what it's like to go through Jim Crow? How would I know what it's like to be an African American? The only way I can is to experience something that might be close to it. And so we wanted to, to think of a way to really hit people over the head with it, or maybe even scare them. But, and, and we toned it down, and it's, it's pretty rough, but we toned it down. I'm looking at Katie as we were making these decisions. And so we wanted people to be surprised when you step over to that movie theater, don't you be looking at that white woman or getting on, say, you need to get off the sidewalk once you see a white person's walking here or something, or don't you touch that. We heard about African Americans could not try on any clothes or shoes or anything in the stores during this time period. They just had to, to buy them. They were not allowed to, to try them on to see if they fit. And so we talk about, um, you know, you, you, you can't try that on. So we tried to come up with some things that would really, in many ways, um, give the give uh, some sense of what it might be like if you were an African American person that accidentally or maybe even purposely crossed the line, crossed that line into a, to to the white. The experience in going through that is something. And just on yesterday, I watched a gentleman go through, and he kept jumping. And I said, think about that if that was me and you were saying that. See, all of these are teaching moments. It's the, the best ex educational experience that anybody could have, and especially for children, because they don't understand it. They laugh at it. But what we do is we, hum we, we go in on them like, 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 like honey, like bees to honey, so that we can talk to them about it. So then that changes, the laughing changes, and then they start begin to ask us questions. Well, how did that person feel going through that? And then when I talked to, I had one young lady just recently crying and crying and crying, and I asked her why. She said, I'm crying for my grandmother because my grandmother possibly went through this. These are the oral histories. These are the lessons. These are the talks that we get from people going through gallery too. Other questions? Yes. Well, it's sort of a question, but more of a comment, um, sort of combining what's been said as far as an education piece and learning. So everyone in this room is a sum of all the experiences. We, we learn from our experiences. And what's been created here in uh, deliberate and also um, because it's the way we live life. These experiences that some of us who are Caucasian, um, I had the fortune of growing up in a real small town, um, so knew a lot of these sort of things, but the point is, is that when we watch these things like the three of you were talking about, we know they're learning. Because again, we learn how to live what's comfortable to us, but also when things are uncomfortable and we figure out a way with this discomfort to either make ourselves comfortable or 
figure out a way to be a part of something that makes an educational moment. And we do call those life influence moments. Y'all are doing a fabulous job. Congratulations to the whole process because we get a chance to bring people to Mississippi all the time <coughs> and show them who we are, recognizing that we are the product of the stereotypes that we didn't necessarily have anything to do with building, but we have a chance to change. So it's a fabulous job, and we are learning as your school teacher. We are learning from the two of you the experiences that people are having and all that went into it. When you leave those museums, you are better educated. And, and just for me to piggyback off what you're saying, is that you know we've had this sore and this bandage on the sore for a long time. It's time to take it off, let it breathe, and then what happens is now that kumbaya moment is gonna happen. <laughs> and we're gonna make Mississippi, through these two museums, we're gonna make Mississippi the best Mississippi that it can be. Because finally, the truth is there, it's out there, and the programming we can do around it we can come together in a room. That's right. <laughs> we can come together in a room and talk about our differences, but talk about how we are alike, and which makes it so much easier for all of us. We have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. Has the uh, attendance broken any record, and has there been um, surprises as far as that? The um, MDA had uh, predicted that we would have 180,000 annually, and we've already broken that. We haven't had 180,000 in a year, but we have had about 110,000 in uh, less than four months. So we think we're going to break that record. And I, I really, really do think, uh, as I may have already said, that. Um, the overwhelming African American visitation to me is saying that they they uh, feel like they finally have a place that belongs to them, and that it actually told the stories that it should. And Macy, when you were talking, I was reminded of a white male, older white male, that shared with us. He was in the exhibit, and two um, older black females were talking about some circumstance and what they were recalling and he asked a question to them and they he said I never would have probably ever talked to the, them or would have ever run into them if we hadn't been standing close to each other he said we went through the whole museum like four hours later we'd gone through the whole museum together they sharing their African American perspective and my sharing my white perspective and Oh boy, that's a success right there. Mm -hmm. And I'm oh, sorry, sorry. No. But that always makes me think also, we have this amazing opportunity. We have over 100 volunteers, these ambassadors that are in the museums. Uh, and stepping into the very first training, you saw how racially diverse the group was. And I was struck by it. I thought, look at all of these people, all of a certain age, all right, retired, <laughs> but um, who had lived, <laughs> experienced. Um, but are from the era that we're talking about in the Civil Rights Museum. And so the fact that now this, this interracial um, group can come together and talk about these stories in the galleries and with each other uh, is remarkable. And I look forward to visiting with them every day. Thank you. I hope if you haven't been to the museums, this will finally push you over to go get a membership, go as much as you can, go by yourself, bring your family members. It's a powerful experience that you need some time to process and walk through. We're incredibly lucky to have all of the support that we have. Before we go, I do want to recognize anybody in the room, whether with Mississippi Department of Archives and History or, um, or outside professionals and consultants, if you were involved with the planning or execution of the opening of the museums, will you please stand so we can recognize you?
send our students your way and visit the spaces. And thank you so much for offering this to us. This is one of the highlights of recent tours that we've taken with prospective students. And I know that you're doing a lot for us in terms of meeting our mission. So thank you. Thank you to all for coming. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Stay dry tomorrow. Enjoy it while you can. Thank you.